Good morning. It is the Lord's Day, and I believe I, I can't see. I've looked at the calendar. It's the 21st of uh, March, and next Sunday is Palm Sunday, and the Sunday after that is Easter. And uh, our theme for Palm Sunday is going to be Christ the Lamb going all the way through Easter. And we're going to be looking at some of the Feast of Israel and how Jesus fulfilled those. But today we're looking at the scripture that says, do not grieve God. Do not grieve God. And let's look at the scripture from Ephesians 4, 30 through 32. It says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by which you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. And today, there are four reasons that we shouldn't grieve God. And I, I want to ask you today, do you, have you ever grieved your family? Why is it that sometimes we tend to grieve the people we love the most? Why is that? And when you marry a wife and uh, or a husband and the two become one flesh, why would you ever want to grieve that person? Why would you want to grieve the people who bore you into this world? And why would you want to grieve the people you bore into this world? And why would we want to grieve our brothers and sisters in Christ? And why would we want to grieve the God who is our Heavenly Father and the, and the Son who saved us and the Holy Spirit who lives within? So the first thing we want to talk about is First reason we don't want to grieve God is that we have a relationship with him. And if we look in our text in verse 30, it says the Holy Spirit of God. In verse 32, it says God in Christ. So let's look at this relationship. It begins with God, the Father. Every parent has a dream for their child. And when our children are little and their little feet are pitter-pattering across the floor, we are amazed with them. We're amazed at how much they learn, how fast they catch on, how smart they are. And then 20 years later, our hearts are grieved that they, sometimes it's because they've uh, done things that we don't approve of. Or sometimes it's just they want a different way, a good way, but a different way. And parents really do have grief. And so God is a real person and God the Father has grief over creation. He has grief over those who reject him. But he also has grief over his children and how they live. Now, then we have Jesus, our Savior. He is the purchaser of our soul. He owns us. The Bible says, you're not your own. You're bought with a price. He is the one we call master and Lord. And yet, I think sometimes the Lord in heaven is grieved by a lot of lip service and not a lot of actual obedience. And then we have the Holy Spirit who the Lord said, would be a comforter who come, but he's an indweller, an abider. He lives within us. This is a unique relationship we have with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But I'd like to talk about the unique commitment that the Godhead has to us. And I'd like to make this statement that God cannot walk away. If we look at Matthew 8, 28, 20, this is what the Lord said. Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And Hebrews 13 and 5 says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Someone may say, well, doesn't God ever get say enough and walk away? No. No. 
But then we look at Psalms 51.11 and David when he was in sin and he cried out to God for forgiveness. He said, cast me not away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. What does that mean? Can God leave us? No, because the Holy Spirit has sealed us till the day of redemption. And God has said, no one can pluck you out of the Father's hand. Well, but here is the thing. When we sin against God and grieve the Holy Spirit, we start building a wall in our heart. On one side of the wall is the indwelling presence of God. On the other side of the wall is the things we protect our life of sin. And the more blocks we put on, the higher it is and the less we experience God. And we continue to sin, those walls get thicker and deeper. Sometimes we make unknown decisions. You know what an unknown decision is? It's a little bit like playing Jenga. When you pull this block out, you didn't know what it's going to do to all the blocks above. Sometimes we commit little things that create unintended consequences. And many other blocks fall and we're in a whole bunch more trouble. And we've committed a whole bunch more sin than we ever thought because of the little things. Actually, Solomon said the little foxes ruined the vine. And so what happens is, is our relationship deteriorates. But here's what people fail to understand. We have a legal relationship with God. We are adopted. We are sanctified, which means we're set apart, declared his. And we are sealed with a spirit. Our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And we are justified in heaven to where our sins are washed away and the righteousness of Christ is put on our record. But despite all of that, our experiential relationship with God may deteriorate. It's like a marriage. You can still be very, very married. I've even known some people who are married and haven't seen their husband or wife for five or six years. And the relationship is gone. And that's why David said, Do not take my holy, your Holy Spirit from me. Do not cast me from your presence. Because God seems so far away. But here's what I want to say. Oh, Christian, no matter what you're doing in your heart, no matter the thoughts and the evil and or the bad things you're doing or the things you say the things you the rooms that you've sealed off and don't let the holy spirit in by the way how would you like it if if you were married and your husband said okay these five rooms are locked you're never allowed in there that wouldn't fly very well but people do it to god all the time but here's what i have to tell you the holy spirit lives there and he lives with your sin you know what that means he's grieved why is it we grieve those who are most committed to us god the father loved us while we were yet sinners christ died for us and the holy spirit spread his love abroad in our heart why do we grieve the ones who love us the most no one has ever loved you like God has. And the Holy Spirit lives with it. The second reason that we ought not grieve the Holy Spirit is because of Redemption Day. It says we are sealed by the Spirit till the day of redemption. And the scripture tells us do not grieve the Holy Spirit were sealed by him. The day of redemption is the end of our life on this earth, but it is the beginning of joy. The day of the redemption is the end of our opportunity to glorify God in this life, but it is 
the beginning of new life, but when God gave us eternal life, we can glorify him. And no longer can we do that in the same way. It is the end of our voluntarily following Jesus. Do you love the song? I have decided to follow Jesus. I love that song. It's the end of our adventure in the Christian life. And yes, there are people who get to heaven and they're saved, the Bible says, so as by fire. And what does that mean? Well, it means this, that they got to heaven as if they were in a fire, the house burned down and they got without no clothes. They just jumped out the window in their nightshirt and out they were and they're just glad to be saved. Redemption Day is a wonderful, wonderful thing. But if you meet Jesus and the tears have been running down his face because of the way you destroyed your life on earth because you did not take the gift of eternal life and glorify him because you did not follow him and your Christian life adventure was more of the self-life and you come in with your night shirt on and, and you brought no jewels in your crown. That will not be as great a day as it could have been. It could have been so much more. The third reason that we need not grieve the Holy Spirit is because we are called to repentance. In verse 31, it says, Let and put away. Let all bitterness be put away. So let's look at a review of last week. Two weeks ago, we learned about sins that were common in the world. And this was immorality and things like that. And then sins that were common among church people. Things like lying and, and anger and thing, unforgiveness. But today we're talking about sins of the temper and tongue. It says of the uh, temper is bitterness, clamor, or bitterness, wrath, and anger. You have bitterness toward someone, rebellion in your heart against authority. Is there wrath you'd like to hurt him? Do you have anger? You get home and you're just... <sighs> That's a sin. Do you have the anger of the tongue, which is clamor and evil speaking? That's a way of getting back at people. We don't like what's going on, so we create a fuss until we get it or destroy them. Or do you have malice, which is hateful actions toward someone? Well, these are all things we're supposed to put away. But guess what? Until you do, the Holy Spirit has to live with it. Lastly, God wants us to have a redemptive attitude. And this is one reason we shouldn't be grieving the Holy Spirit, because we should have a redemptive attitude like our Heavenly Father. First, he says, be kind to one another, as God is kind, as Jesus was kind. Be tender-hearted. Do not be so mean and nasty and snarly. Be tender-hearted, which means uh, I'll give him the grace and benefit of the doubt. Be forgiving. Walk away and say, well, whatever, and don't let it bother you. Because God forgave you. In fact, on the cross, he looked down and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then I think of the fruit of the Spirit, that the Spirit so wants to build in your life, and sometimes he's crying because you won't let him. The fruit of the Spirit is a sign of response to God, and it is a gauge of humility and submission. <clears throat> well, I have one more thing to say. The Holy Spirit has to live with it. 
Well, I feel for those who have to live with someone who is very difficult to live with, some who uh, have loved ones who uh, are emotionally uh, damaged, or even a person is married to someone who has become an alcoholic. But folks, we are sinaholics. And the Holy Spirit has promised to live and stay in our hearts forever. And he must be weeping many, many moments. And when we're not responding to him, and when we're in our bitterness, our wrath, and our anger, and our clamor, and our evil speaking with malice, the Holy Spirit's heart is broken. Oh, dear Christian, the Holy Spirit has had to live with so much in our lives. And so we are called not to grieve him. In conclusion, I would like to say this. Do you love God? Do you love him? And then I'd like to say, does your life grieve God? And thirdly, I'd like to say, perhaps change is in order. God has committed himself to you. Christ has committed himself to you. The Holy Spirit is committed to live in your heart. And he's in there just to uprooting all your worldliness and selfishness and sin. But I'll tell you what, if you have a stubborn heart, I'm sure there's times the Holy Spirit just weeps. God help us all to submit to the Spirit of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that you live with us, put up with us, and encourage us. But help us to understand how we hurt you. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.